Hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Simpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 37 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. Uh, I'm delighted to say we've got Ruth Bell here again for a fourth and final webinar of 2015. Um, Ruth's going to be talking today about validation of food safety control measures. Um, I won't go into, I'll leave it up to Ruth to tell you about it, so I won't read the synopsis, but there's a lot of confusion about ver verification, validation, how to do it properly. Uh, we always get lots of questions on the discussion forum about it. So uh, hopefully today, Ruth will um, put our minds to, to rest once and for all about the subject. Uh, <laughs> I'd just like to say at this point, thanks to the sponsors who've supported us throughout 2015, Trace Analytics, Safe Food 360, FF, FSSC 22000 and IFS. Um, we are going to be running webinars next year again for 2016. Uh, we're currently in, in the process of uh, making the program for that. And um, we'll be launching that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so keep your eye out for that. Ruth is there. Hi, Ruth. In, Hi, good it afternoon. It looks like sunny Yorkshire today. Um, th th there's a tiny bit of sun, but not too much. There's an awful lot of wind and rain. I know there's more to come this weekend, I think. So, yes. but we can we can definitely see a bit of sun radiating through your window there, which is <laughs> it's nice. Um, okay, so what what I'll do is I'll just uh, tell the audience about next week's webinar, and then I'll come back to you for the presentation shortly, Ruth. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, next week we think we've got a webinar. Uh, it's food and beverage authenticity with uh, a chap called Mehmet. Um, Thus far, uh, we've been unable to make contact, so we're not sure 100% whether it will be going ahead next week. So I'm not putting it in the sidebar uh, for you to register. We'll do that by email once uh, we've uh, definitely finalized that. Uh, it's a shame if we can't do that because food authenticity um, is, is a big subject at the moment. Okay, uh, I'm going to be um, sharing the presentation today because we've got a few technical problems so please bear with us um, but here we go over to Ruth uh, can you see the can you see the uh, slide Ruth yes I can yes okay. thank you just yep. uh, tap me on the head when you want me to uh, change it okay <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome along to this uh, overview, really, of um, validation of um, control measures. Okay, so we can go to the next one. Okay. So just very, very quickly, a little bit about about me. Um, I work as a consultant in the in the food industry. Um, I have a background in technical management and quality management, mainly in the uh, the dairy sector. So ice cream processing, cheese processing, milk processing. Um, but I, I now uh, work with businesses to help them to set up their quality and food safety management systems based around the majority of the GFSI standards. Um, along with that, there's all the the tack-ons, um, the ethical and the uh, TASUP, the VASUP, um, allergen awareness, all of those types of things. Um, I also offer technical and legal support to businesses um, and work as a third party auditor for some of the GFSI standards. Okay, great. <laughs> Next one. So I represent uh, AF Associates and we are international food safety and quality management specialists uh, helping businesses of all sizes in the, both the feed and the, the food industry at all stages of the, um, the, the food chain really to help um, uh, system development uh, with some of the standards advice, um, as I say, the legislation, technical support. And we also offer training courses both face-to-face uh, -face, in house and via e-learning in a variety of different um, topics so that's enough about uh, about us and uh, now to get on to have a think about today's webinar and what we're going to include okay so uh, today it's all about um, uh, validation of control measures we haven't got long so it, it's very much an overview but just really trying to define validation and um, separate out what is validation and what is verification because there is quite a lot of confusion about the two and what what's involved in in both so we're going to have a think as well where validation sits within the codex 12-step logic sequence because it's very well hidden 
and um, then just briefly talk you through the, the process of validation and um, the practical validation, theoretical validation of um, our HACCP system and our control measures. Great, okay. So where does it where does it all fit? Well, it's within our food safety management systems, and um, we all very well know that HACCP is uh, really well established in manufacturing for both food and and feed as a, a tool to use to ensure the safety of our food products um, by being a preventative system, and. How HACCP's evolved, it's very much focused on the process and controlling the process rather than historically um, uh, food safety was managed through end the, uh, controlling the product and end product testing. There are a lot of limitations with testing uh, the product at the, at the end, whereas if you know your process is in control, you can then by um, default virtually say that um, I am producing a safe product um, provided you have got that correct process and um, uh, provided that you, you do uh, monitor your process and know that it's in control. So this is where we, we start to introduce the idea of, um, of validation. Um, okay, can we have the next slide? Thank you. But um, the problem really uh, is how do you know that your process is designed and is working on a day to day basis correctly so that it uh, it does uh, ensure that we are producing a safe product. And this is through both validation and verification. But what we really have to do is start to distinguish the difference between the two and understand when we need to be validating and when we need to be verifying. So next one. Thank you. So first of all, um, before we get going, um, we, I thought we could put a poll out as to um, do you know or do you understand the difference between validation and verification? So at the moment it's just uh, yes you think you do or no you, you're not too sure. Okay, I've loaded that in the sidebar. If you'd like to click on one of those answers, yes or no, and uh, wow, that's quite surprising actually. The uh, vast majority do know the difference between validation and verification. Great. So it's about 85% uh, to 15%, 85% do and 15% don't. Oh, that's great then. So, Positive. Uh... Yes, yes, yes. You can go right. on. You can go we, on. We now. can. Yes, we can. Uh, we can move on. So we'll uh, we'll move on to the next next slide. Um, so when we start to look within our twelve step logic sequence of how to apply the Codex HACCP principles, um, if you actually look at the, the the twelve steps, it doesn't anywhere mention the word validation. <laughs> we've actually got to um, dig within the sixth Codex HACCP principle, which is um, established verification procedures. And um, validation is hidden within that um, sixth principle or the uh, 11th in your 12 step logic sequence. And establishing verification procedures, it's all about making sure that the food safety management system is working. And so some of the activities that are actually involved within that um, uh, principle six verification are both validation, verification, as well as ongoing maintenance of the um, uh, food safety management system and reviewing the food safety management system. So the uh, Codex HACCP um, principle six really does cover a, a variety of different activities. And uh, I think this is one of the first problems that validation does tend to get lost in, in amongst um, everything, everything else. Okay, can we have the next slide? Thank you. So if we're thinking about um, uh, verification as part of um, principle six or the 11th in the in the 12 steps, um, the basic role is to make sure that the food safety management system or the HACCP plan is functioning as it's been designed and that it is effective um, on a, uh, an ongoing period of, of time so that we've got the design right, we've got the, um, uh, the science right, we've got the technical um, 
information right and then on a day-to-day -day basis that plan is being used and it is effective in controlling our food safety hazards and giving us confidence that we are producing safe food. Great, can we have the next one? I quite like this definition. This is the NACMCF definition of, of validation. And they actually recognize that um, validation is part of verification. And what they're saying is that validation is the element of verification focused on collecting and evaluating scientific and technical information to determine if the HACCP plan, when properly implemented, will effectively control the hazards. So it's all about looking at where you've got your information from, the justification for your decisions, and asking if we follow this plan on paper that we've got documented, um, is it correct? Will it give us a, a safe product? So I think this is really good because it, it does recognize that validation is part of um, uh, your verification activities. Okay, next one. And um, I think this this table uh, represents it very nicely because validation as a, as a sub component of verification. So if you look at verification principle six, it does have two very distinct strands to it. Um, we've got the, the validation. In other words, is your HACCP plan technically valid? Um, is it uh, scientifically sound? And then we talk about verification for compliance. In other words, are we doing what our plan says that we should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? There's an awful lot of confusion about the terminology and um, uh, people's understanding of what verification activities actually involve. And I think the confusion has come because the term verification is actually used with two different meanings. So if you're referring to verification as the big principle six, it does mean that you will be doing elements of validation. You will be doing elements of verification for compliance along with um, ongoing maintenance and review. But very often we talk about verification and we're actually just meaning the um, small part, the compliance element. So validation and verification are very definitely separate activities and they're um, conducted at different stages within the design, the development and the operation of a HACCP system. Great, next one. Thank you. Um, so what we're saying is um, validation is uh, the, the processes and the activities that we do to make sure that um, all the food safety control measures that we've identified um, will be capable of um, actually being effective and producing safe, safe product. And um, it's all the activities that we need to go through to make sure that those um, control measures um, are uh, going to work when we use them on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's absolutely essential that we um, validate our control measures before we implement them. If that isn't done, it is actually possible to implement an invalid plan and then to verify for compliance and say that you're in compliance. So for example, um, you may have been um, setting a critical limit on a thermal process. You've got the critical limit incorrect, um, uh, but when you come to verify for compliance, you, so long as you are hitting that critical limit in terms of compliance, you'd be saying, yes, we're achieving what we said we should have been doing. Um, so I think this really highlights the importance of uh, validation and making sure that um, our processes and our control measures have been validated so that we do know that they will be capable of giving us a safe product. Next. If we, if we really break it down, I like simple and um, I think uh, validation basically uh, splits down into will it work? In other words, you're looking at your document and you're saying, if we use this, will it give us a safe product? Is it the right thing to do? As opposed to verification, which is asking, is it working? And are we doing what we say we should be, um, should be doing? Okay. So we've just got a, another quick poll um, to ask, have you conducted validation studies? So either a yes or a, or a no. Just uh, bear with me a second. Um, yep. 
uh, have your conductive validation studies. Right, I'm setting that pole in the sidebar uh, as we speak. So when that appears, if you could just vote. Uh, and the shape of the poll is about 70, 30 have conducted validation studies. Great. Right. Um, okay. That's good then. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. On we go. Right. Okay. So um, the actual process of validation, when we come on to think how we're going to uh, validate, um, there are two main methods that we would we would use. Um, you can validate theoretically, and this is by ensuring that um, what you've got documented on paper is correct and um, uh, will give you that, that safe product. And then we can validate practically and experimentally. And this is where we are asking ourselves, will the control measures be capable of um, uh, controlling the hazard to pre preventing it, reducing it, eliminating it down to a, a safe, safe level. So when we begin to validate, generally it's a combination of both um, theoretical validation and practical experimental validation. Uh, when we do validate, it generally occurs at, at three times. You would be validating during um, uh, the design of a HACCP system and at the end of a, uh, the design of a HACCP system. There's always a, a need for ongoing revalidation. That's generally um, done on an annual basis. And the one that has to trigger is a revalidation due to change. And that's the one where and, uh, even the smallest of um, changes to a process or to a recipe um, or to a, to a product can have a significant impact on, um, on food safety. And if we don't pick that up, we can, we can end up with um, control measures that become invalid. So if we first of all have a look at the, uh, the theoretical validation, so that's the next one. Okay, this um, we we tend to look theoretically as we're designing a HACCP system, and at the end of end of design, and this perhaps looks um, uh, slightly bigger than the control measures because theoretical validation would actually look at the whole of your HACCP document and the whole of your HACCP plan, and the main aim of it is to make sure that any justifications, any decisions, are based on some sort of um, scientific evidence and um, they're not on a uh, company custom where the, the classic line you often hear is we've been doing it like this for 40 years and we haven't had a problem so why do we have to make any changes um, but where has the science come from what has been used we have to make sure in particular though that any controls that we're putting in place will be able to achieve safety um, at uh, ccps at control points but also within the prerequisite programs and um, any type of validation, whether it's the practical validations, whether it's the theoretical validations, have to be documented. So all the information that we've used as part of a validation needs to be gathered and it needs to be retained because it's evidence, it's justification that um, it, what you're using is and uh, will be effective. Okay, next. So perhaps um, theoretically, as we're um, going through and designing a, a HACCP system and um, at the end of the design of a HACCP system, when you've got a, a, a sort of a whole, a whole document, um, you will be, be beginning to go through some of the things that you'd be looking at. Um, you'd need to look at the team and um, have, we, have we got a valid team? In other words, um, are the team um, capable? Are the team competent? Are the team trained? Do the team have knowledge and experience in the particular area that we're, we're looking to put a system in? You would need to look at the, um, the terms of reference and just make sure that uh, everything within the terms of reference was um, technically correct, that we've got the right information in there, that we've got the right scope. Um, we're identifying the correct type of hazards for the, for the product. Um, so the uh, general information within the scope is, is correct. And um, probably the only place within the 12-step uh, logic sequence that does actually make some reference to, uh, to carrying out um, some, some checking is the process flow diagram and confirmation of the, um, the process flow diagram. 
So once we've got that, then um, you would be theoretically coming on to look at all the control measures and really asking, have we got the control measures correct? Are they suitable? Will they control the hazard? Um, will they reduce, prevent, eliminate? So for instance, if you've identified a hazard as um, presence of pathogenic microorganism um, in product due to poor supplier controls, um, a control measure of temperature control isn't going to be effective. Um, your control measure would need to be based around um, uh, supplier quality assurance. So it's making sure that we've got the right, right control measure. Um, we'd be needing to look at the CCPs, looking at how the CCPs have been identified, um, what methodology has been used, have we used a, a decision tree, has it been used correctly, um, have the team been using um, just a, a team decision making process and um, really starting to try to uh, determine have we got the right CCPs, has anything been missed. Sometimes when, you, when you're looking for validity it's more what's been missed rather than what's, what's there. Have we got Got all the significant hazards have we missed anything critical limits um, where's the critical limit come from how have you defined your critical limit uh, what parameters have you used what what have you um, uh, sourced that information from then we have to start to determine whether the process is be and will be capable of actually achieving those those critical limits so this is where we get a little bit more into the um, practical uh, validation which I'll come on to talk about in a, in a moment um, theoretically also though you need to be looking at the the monitoring procedures the corrective action procedures and just asking if we followed this monitoring procedure through would it actually detect loss of control and would the corrective actions um, uh, put our system back into into control again okay that's the next one So we do a lot of um, theoretical validation, but um, we also need to uh, to practically challenge our controls. And when we're thinking about um, conducting validation studies, um, there are uh, several steps. I suppose if you're familiar with the plan, do, check, act cycle, it's uh, that's pretty much what we, we need to do. You need to decide on your approach to how you're going to practically challenge your, your controls. So are you going to um, do some theoretical studies perhaps around where you've got your critical limit from? Are you going to do some um, experimental studies, perhaps some challenge testing? Are you going to do um, data collection in normal day-to-day uh, -day production? Um, are you going to use statistical process control? So you need to decide on, on how you're going to conduct your validation studies and, and what combination of approaches you're perhaps going to, to use. You also need to define the parameters that you're going to um, base your um, judgment about the, the validity of your, your control measure on. So are you looking for uh, a log reduction with microorganisms? Are you looking for um, verification of a, a cleaning system? Um, what are you going to set as, as those parameters? It might be microbiological criteria, for instance. Once you've decided on the actual approach that you're going to take and the, the parameters that you're working within and you're going to measure your effectiveness against, you would then go ahead and actually practically conduct the uh, validation studies. So roll your sleeves up and, and get going. This would generate a lot of information um, from which you can then go on and analyze the results and uh, working that back to the parameters that you defined, determine whether your control measure is um, valid or, or not. And the final thing, of course, is that all this would be, would be documented. So practically, it's all about challenging your, your controls, basically to, to push them to, uh, to determine uh, how and when you are likely to get a failure and what would happen if you, if you got a, a failure. And it's really thinking about uh, what are um, the, the collection of um, causes that would give you a failure and if it did happen, what your outcome would, would be. So it's looking at um, what you've currently got in place and do you need to put any additional controls to give you more confidence that your system is going to um, uh, perform over time and um, your HACCP will become more effective. Okay. So a lot of um, practically challenging our controls would take us into uh, statistical process control, your um, your SPC, and it's all about confirming the the process is 
capability. If you remember, I said that um, uh, HACCP is process-led, so it is all about understanding that your, your process is working and um, knowing the limits on that, uh, that process. So do we understand our processing capability at particular points in the process where you've, you've defined control measures? Um, processes don't always generate perfect outputs and there will always be some deviations but um, so long as those deviations uh, stay within our um, common cause variation we can we can confirm that the the process is uh, is is capable and um, uh, the less deviations that we we can get then the more we can confirm that our effect our process is effective so as much as possible this is where we we need to understand our our process and our processing capabilities have we designed the control measures the procedures effectively um, how are you going to continually measure to to determine um, that your, your process is effective and um, how do you measure any area at sorry any errors i can't speak and uh how do you um approach sort of putting things right again okay next one so in terms of your your process capability it's all about the statistical verification um it's all about the the probability or the confidence that you have that you're going to be able to stay within specified limits so initially, theoretically, uh, with control measures, you will have set those limits based on some sort of legislation, some sort of science, some sort of customer guidance. And now within your processing capability, you have to determine if your process each time it runs is capable of staying within those, those limits. So when we validate our process capability, can we do the next slide? Sure. We've, we've really got two, two considerations that we, we need to think about. Um, is the process capable of achieving the particular control that you've put in place? So are you um, capable of achieving the critical limit that's been established, for, for instance? Um, so that critical limit, uh, where have you got it from? And um, uh, is your process going to be able to achieve that each and every time? And um, the other one is, is your process capable of um, consistently controlling the, um, uh, the, the hazard and uh, uh, achieving the critical limit? So this is where we start to really um, push a process and uh, um, think about worst case scenario and conduct some processing capability studies. Can we have a look at the, the next one? So as I said, um, all processes are subject to some um, natural and inherent variability, which is your common cause variation. And so long as you can stay within that, um, you can say that your process is statistically in, in control. It's when we get special cause variation due to unpredictable errors, that's when we start to have, um, have problems. So, so long as we uh, know the range over which the process is, is capable, then um, we can begin to determine that our uh, control measure will be will be effective. So some of the things that you would have to start to think about if you're looking at a, a worst case scenario. So for example, on a on a thermal process, you might be looking at the equipment capabilities. So you'd be looking at the heat penetration within the equipment. So for instance, within an oven, you would need to be finding out um, where the hot spots are, where the cool spots are, where's the slowest heating point, where's the warmest heating point, or fastest heating point. Um, and so you can really determine uh, the points where you would where you would need to put your, your product to um, to determine worst case. You might be looking at the equivalence of two different types of equipment. You may have two different ovens. They don't necessarily behave the same. Um, you would need to look at maintenance because sometimes over a period of time, equipment starts to um, need some maintenance, maybe not working just quite as, as effectively. If you're talking about um, a thermal process and you've got temperature gauges on there, are they calibrated? Do they need calibrating over, over time? They may uh, begin to slip. So it's very much looking at the equipment if you were um, introducing things like steam, pressure, um, does the pressure drop at different times of the day? So it's really beginning to, to work out uh, what would be in terms of the equipment capabilities, it's, it's worst case. 
um, you might be thinking around the, the actual product that you're putting in and the, the nature of the product itself and the temperature distribution within a, a product. So um, different sizes, um, the largest, coldest um, product in the slowest heating point in the, in the oven um, begins to give you your, your worst case. Other things that you would be looking at, though, would be um, around staff competency. So if you're talking about people maintaining equipment, um, have you got uh, personnel that are competent? Do they know what they're, they're, they're doing? Um, staff running the actual process, are they competent? This is where the boundaries, perhaps, of, of validation and verification can become a, a little bit blurred. But in terms of validation, it's really looking at um, the design of training programs. And if staff were trained in a particular operating procedure, will they then be able to manage that process um, uh, effectively? So it's it's looking at the training. It's looking at um, uh, also possible sampling and testing. And when you're validating um, uh, processes. This is the time where you perhaps have the luxury of being able to test to destruction. On day-to-day -day production, we can't 100% sample and test because we wouldn't have a product to sell. Um, whereas when you're conducting validation studies, you certainly can um, test and, and sample and destroy uh, to, to determine that we have got um, the uh, particular parameters that we, we need. Okay, can we do the next slide? Okay, so as I said, to, to confirm your process capability, um, it's uh, really making sure that the, the process is only subject to your, your common cause variation so that it is in statistical process control and that as much as possible we can minimise um, all, all the common causes. So it's, it's by understanding the process um, and understanding um, the, the, the worst case and then, if necessary, putting extra controls in place just to just to make sure that um, uh, we we are within our process control. Okay. Next one. So, particularly around looking at the the processes and the the equipment. Um, you might be asking, have we adequately delivered a, a lethal step? So is the process, if you're looking to achieve a, a six log reduction, um, will your thermal process do that? So we would be testing to, to understand if we could, if we could achieve that. Um, we certainly uh, would be needing to, to determine that we had got the right critical parameters, um, firstly, theoretically, and then that on an ongoing basis, we're able to, to control those. Um, you might be having to look at things like uh, where are you locating data loggers and um, temperature sensors, particularly in um, uh, cooking processes, cooling processes, uh, so that they, they are um, giving you the correct information. You might also be looking at um, uh, tolerances around temperature sensors. So if we're talking about um, uh, plus or minus 0.5, um, we need to build that into our, our control measures. Um, there may be times when temperature sensors can be affected, uh, for instance, in a, in a CIP system, if you're uh, running the CIP, you can, you can um, cause some damage sometimes to some of the temperature sensors. Um, is the startup procedure adequate? Uh, if we're bringing things up to temperature, we're um, beginning to cool things down before we, we put process uh, product into, into a process. Things like um, the product itself, does it go into a process from an ambient temperature? Is it going in from chilled temperature? Is it going in from um, frozen temperature? Just occasionally, things are uh, defined to go in from ambient and they go in from chilled. The process isn't capable. The process will, um, will fail. Corrective actions definitely have to be uh, be defined. They need to be adequate. Will they um, uh, identify the problem? Will they control the um, uh, contain the uh, the product? Will they uh, contain the problem if we if we follow them through? So I've mentioned the incoming material temperature, um, but other things that you might look around the process itself. Have you got separation of, uh, of areas? Is that uh, adequate to, to control the potential of contamination and, uh, and cross-contamination? So a lot of things we need to think about within the, uh, the process and the equipment. A um, little bit more about the equipment. Have we got the next slide? 
Okay. Um, when you do look at validating equipment, you can you can do it in in one of two two ways. It could be by the use of surrogate microorganisms. Um, I I do hasten to add the surrogate microorganisms we need to be using. The last thing we can start doing is um, putting uh, pathogenic microorganisms into a process. Um, <laughs> might uh, cause us a few problems a little bit uh, a little bit later on so one of the um, initial problems that we've got is to determine um, what would be an adequate surrogate microorganism to to use that would uh, behave in a similar way to the particular microorganism that we're really trying to to destroy um, and the second thing that we can do is to uh, just look practically at the at the processing parameters in relation to the control measure that we've we've established. Okay, so can we have the next one? So as I say, a little bit of a, a recap uh, around your, your processing parameters. It's making sure that um, uh, your critical limits, uh, any any um, processing parameters that you're going to, to work to have been established um, from some sort of science and that they are applicable to the to the process that you're you're looking at. There's no point in trying to achieve a botulinum cook on a pasteurizing process. Um, it's all got to be to be relevant. We need to make sure that we, we understand any process variability and um, that we can um, uh, stay within a common cause variation. So I've, I've just given an example there of unevenness of, of roasting. Um, you, you need to make things as um, uh, similar as, as, as possible, but within the bounds of what you're trying to, to do. It may be that um, if we do see a lot of uh, differences that you would have to go back and you would have to um, uh, revalidate you would have to perhaps change parameters you might have to change um, how the process works and how the process operates um, definitely though we need to be running equipment in um, worst case scenario having found out sort of the uh, the worst case conditions the most critical conditions if the process is capable of um, uh, achieving safety in those conditions uh, it should be capable in um, what we might consider more normal conditions we do need to make sure that um, all the parameters are being correctly monitored and um, that your material is being being processed and we may need to make sure that we're recording um, all of the, the the monitoring parameters so that we've got evidence there and should we need to do any investigations that information is going to be there and going to be be available and the final one just to recap is make sure that we're aware of the tolerance on any measuring devices so that you've set limits uh, building that tolerance in okay the next one it's um uh, sort of stands to reason that any process and monitoring equipment uh, we're going to have to make sure that it, it is there it is available and it is in 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 place and that the monitoring equipment uh, will be actually capable of um, uh, achieving what you're looking for so for instance if you've got a, a thermal process and you're wanting to to monitor with uh, some form of temperature probe and you want to uh, monitor to three decimal places you've got to make sure that the equipment is capable of giving you three decimal places and that it is properly calibrated and it's uh, calibrated to a national standard so we've got confidence in the readings that we're we're getting okay What I've been talking about is very much um, what you would do if you were um, designing a new HACCP plan or you were designing a new control measure, whether it is at a CCP or whether it is um, just at a control point or whether it's a, a practical control measure um, that sits within one of the prerequisite programs. So we very definitely need to know that these controls will work before we go live and implement them. But then on an ongoing basis we do need to revalidate our food safety management system and our HACCP plan generally this does happen annually but um, it may be more frequently this is sometimes based around um, standards requirements around customer requirements um, and what you're doing when you're revalidating is just um, assessing how effective the plan has been over time and it's a chance to go back and re-challenge any um, initial decisions, re-challenge controls. 
So sometimes um, revalidation is done. Uh, some of it is theoretical, and you would just be looking back at the plan over over time and asking, um, is it is it still uh, true? Is it still effective? Is it still valid? But this is also an opportunity to. Um, uh, revalidate some of the practical controls as well and just um, with the um, uh, beauty of hindsight now you can you can go back and uh, perhaps uh, look at uh, data that you've gathered just to reconfirm that um, some of the processes are um, still valid and still capable of achieving the controls that you're you're looking for so ongoing revalidation is uh, is really essential can we do the next slide and as I say, most of that, um, you can study historical data because we generate a, a, a raft of, of data. It may be that you were looking at a, the validation of a cleaning process and you could go back and you could look back over your data and that would help you to confirm that uh, over a five month period, a two month period, a three week period, whatever you're looking at, um, you could use that data and confirm that yes, um, our process was in control or alternatively, it could be by conducting further uh, validation trials and further experimentation. Okay, next one. This is the uh, this is the key one though that um, uh, revalidation prompted by change. This could happen at any stage, and this is where um, the HACCP team or the um, food safety management team really need to be. Um, uh, uh, keeping up to date with what's going on and, and any changes and there needs to be mechanisms in place to make sure that any changes um, are passed through the food safety management team or the HACCP team for, for consideration because even a, a, a really minor change perhaps in a, in a pH we may move from a pH 4.5 to a pH 4.6 which uh, could have a, a, a really significant impact on the on the safety of your, your products um, it's common for it to happen we we change perhaps a, a raw ingredient and um, it's uh, just as I say the, the pH is slightly different and you'll start to uh, perhaps see some some issues coming through maybe um, there's a lot of um, work going on at the moment reformulating reducing salt content um, salt acts as a, a an inhibitor it could be that um, you've reduced salt content you haven't gone back and revalidated your HACCP plant and then find in the future that you you're starting to get some problems and some some issues and this is where our proactive system would fail and uh, would start to cause problems because the way they would manifest themselves would be as um, a possible injury or a possible food poisoning outbreak and um, recalls and um, uh, and withdrawals so revalidation prompted by change it can happen at any time and the HACCP team really does need to to keep um, abreast of what's going on and possibly at that stage conduct further um, experimentation on on control measures okay next one but at whatever stage, whether it's at the uh, design stage, whether it's at the end of design, whether it's your annual revalidation or a revalidation prompted by change, we need to be documenting all the validation activities. We need to keep records of the trials. They're all justifications. They're all evidence that you have um, validated your control measures, that you know your process is capable of, of producing a safe product. It gives you confidence but um, it will also be there as evidence to provide to um, anybody else that's looking at your HACCP system. We've talked very much about um, validating control measures, um, you uh, looking at your own control measures within your own operation. It could be that you also go and uh, or need to go and look at um, suppliers and uh, maybe validating the um, uh, control measures of, of suppliers. There you perhaps haven't got the beauty of being able to roll your sleeves up and, and conduct practical validation trials. So certainly if you were going externally and looking at um, uh, suppliers, it would be very much looking theoretically at um, uh, their decision making process and then um, secondly looking for the evidence of their validation activities so this is why um, keeping evidence is, is so key because so many people will be asking for your information to uh, see that you have validated your activities okay and just the, the 
last one we've got a, a little bit of a poll there um uh, do you think you would now change how you approach validation either a yes or a no so hopefully um you've learned something today so this will be a barometer so a good 70 odd percent uh obviously have picked something up today that they will make a change to their uh, their approach to validation so well done ruth oh, round, that sounds... of, round of applause to you ruth <laughs> that sounds good that sounds good um as i say i think it's it, the, the clear thing is to separate out validation activities from from verification activities very often validation is actually done um, but it sort of slips in under the radar people don't realize they're doing it because a lot of what we are talking about as validation as part of our food safety management system is often referred to as commissioning in of new equipment um, and uh, it's just tying up that link really and making sure that uh, um, any control measures you have got the evidence that you know you can produce safe safe product yeah so great okay um, happy to take any questions brilliant oh that's great oh, I th that was quite difficult me trying to um, yes. share that but we've managed it brilliant thanks very much for that Ruth okay. um, we will take questions just one thing uh, from me first I'm I'm well known uh, as being a very poor navigator in my car but with, with my family, always getting lost. So um, what I tend to do is just set off. If we're going on a family day out, I'll just set off driving um, and then I'll be counting the miles. I'll be looking at my speedometer, doing 70 mile an hour and thinking we've got another mile, we've got everything's great and then realize we're in completely the wrong place. So if I do validation at the start of the journey, you know, look at a, look at a map, uh, perhaps get some instructions, look at the literature uh, uh, and make it scientific instead of guessing it, uh, then I might be, am I on the, the right lines there? Is that validation and verification? Um, yes, sort of. I think, yes, if, if you validated your journey first and you had, um, yes, looked at the map and determined where you want it to go and uh, uh, will you will you be able to do it, I, you, you don't suddenly find you've got to cross a ford or some, something like that. Exactly. Um, yes, and then your, your verification is, uh, <laughs> did it actually work? <laughs> did, you, yeah. did you manage it? Um, yeah, well, that's it. So I've got it in my mind now. Yeah, will it work? Should it work? Can it work? And then verification is, does it, is it work working? in practice? Is it working in practice? That's yes. great. Okay, yeah. let's let's try and uh, pick up some uh, questions now. Um, there are there are a lot of questions. Um, let's have a look at this one. How do you? Uh, Kirsten said, "How do you how do you validate CCPs, metal detectors that have been in place for years and are tested, verified multiple times every day? How then? How do you go back and validate that?" Okay. Um, well, you could use some of the data that you've generated on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, go go back and uh, use use that as part of your validation. But um, when if I go back to the beginning, if you were initially um, validating a, a metal detector, you would do some form of challenge testing on it. So you would start to put test strips through and a variety of different test strips at uh, uh, different sensitivities until you got down to the, uh, the, the the sensitivity that the metal detector would would um, uh, pick up. You would have to determine um, the where the on with on the aperture where the sort of the detection capabilities are. You would have to think about um, the rejection mechanism mechanism and um, how it works and uh, it, it's it would be basically putting a lot of trials through at, um, at uh, sort of your, your worst case really so it's it's determining where where's the point of detection um, what's the um, smallest uh, level of detection the orientation the type of the product the uh, sort of moisture of the product salt content all, all of those types of things um, and uh, probably if you've if you've got an awful lot of data that uh, um, says on a day-to-day -day basis that these uh, metal detectors are working and have been verified it would be just checking back to see if you have some initial data probably when the machinery was was commissioned in that did 
those those types of trials and if you had that and then your ongoing data saying that um you know this thing works on a day-to-day -day basis that that should form part of your of your validation okay brilliant um there is actually um robert rogers uh, from metal at toledo did um, a webinar earlier this year about how to do exactly that validate your your metal detector so that's in the webinar ar archive so uh, take a look there as well um you say talking before about validation and verification with, with training programs and somebody's asked how do you validate a pest control program is that possible to validate a pest control program um i think if you if you were looking at a, a pest control program it's very much looking just theoretically at it and uh, you would be um looking at who who've you got coming in to do the pest control program so is it is it um somebody reputable or is it somebody else um it's it's a little bit harder around some of the prerequisites and certainly things like uh, where it's a, a more a paper-based system probably to uh, to validate it but it it would be uh, just it, i suppose you're, you're asking yourself again if if we use this particular pest control program will it will it work so it's just looking theoretically at the at the control program and looking at um, um have the right um types of pests been identified and uh, how often are we going to um uh, to do checks how often uh, what type of um uh baits are being used and and that type of thing because you could uh, potentially um decide i'm going to uh, manage I don't know birds, but you not have any birds, and your and your biggest hazard would be rodents and flying insects. Yeah, yeah. So you're doing that um, sort of going through that process without even thinking about it. Sometimes you, you pretty you much know. do. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, are, are we covered? What, what needs covering? You know, how is it going to work, etc. Without yeah. calling it validation and verification. I but, think so. Yeah. Um, somebody asked. If somebody asked a similar thing is how do you validate prp's prerequisites and the way, way you was talking before ruth obviously it, when you critical control points you know mm -hmm. like say, say for example cooking or reducing microbes uh, etc so i mean is that a similar thing prp's prerequisite procedures as the pest control that you've just been talking about yeah, I mean, I, I think um, probably if you start to look in the standards, they're, they're asking you to um, validate uh, practical control measures, if you like. So anything where you've got a uh, something that you're doing practically. So, for instance, cleaning and disinfection um, could be considered to be a prerequisite program. So you would validate your cleaning methodology and uh, that would be do through um, uh, doing a series of cleaning trials so you would think about what it is you want to clean how you're going to clean it when are you going to clean it um, what what materials are you going to clean you would then um, uh, run the process run the cleaning and that's where you would do an awful lot of um, swab testing and ATP testing however you decided you want it to um, to actually measure that it was it was working properly um, so uh, some some of the prerequisites is very definite sort of uh, what I would call practical control measures and practical activities that you're doing which you would you would then then validate um, it uh, some of the others for instance the the pest control that's a lot more way you would be just looking theoretically at the at the documentation and um, determining is it is it okay is it is it correct yeah and, and also I think somebody mentioned on, on the pest control when you look at the trends and, and uh, things like that then is that part of validation after the facts in a way that it, it almost is i mean the, the as i said the boundaries on them get a little bit blurred and yeah. um, what you are actually doing on a on an ongoing basis perhaps when you're auditing your pest control and and so on that's that's you're verifying that it's happening and it is it is being done but um when you start to look at trending and you start to look at some of the information and the historical data that you've been generating then you're what you're really doing is beginning to uh, verify the validity so you're verifying yeah. that it is it is valid yeah uh okay uh guyan uh, uh, i mean he's talking about the food safety modernization act but he's saying in their new rules that um there is no need uh, to validate recall programs and supplier control programs 
Would you have any thoughts on that? Uh, that in the FS Food Safety Modernisation Act, they're saying that you do not need to validate recall and supplier control programmes. Okay, I suppose that's another one that's probably, rather than it being a practical control measure within your operation at a particular stage in your operation, it's it's a sort of a a wider a wider more theoretical thing that you, you you're doing, um, but I would still say that you need to think about it because you could have set up an ineffective recall call program that that wouldn't work. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's been a lot of discussion about metal detectors uh, oh, amongst, dreaded. <laughs> amongst the attendees uh, between each other. I mean, um, you, Yusuf has said, why, why don't we start a discussion on the discussion forum? It's probably a good idea that, I mean, to take um, some of these discussions that you start in the sidebar, are very limited. If you wanted to take any of those onto the discussion forum, I, I do um, urge you to join the forum and you can uh, debate things at length there, uh, start new topics and things. So um, do do that. Uh, if you're not a member, just go and sign up for free. Uh, what about labelling, Ebenezer has asked. What about labelling? What about, what about labelling? <laughs> uh, um, how do you validate, how do you validate um, labels, your labelling programme? <laughs> how do you validate your labelling programme? Right. Um, well, I suppose initially you're going back to looking at um, have you got the right information on the label? So it's it's more rather than practically, it's probably initially more theoretically. So if you're talking, I, I mean, are, are we talking about a, a label that's got the ingredient declaration or are you just talking about labeling the, um, uh, the date coding? Well, yeah, I mean, if you, well, would, would then, let's say, that to take that on then, that labelling, imagine if it's um, ingredients on some packaging, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's printed packaging, so would that include making sure that the printer is capable of delivering almost perfect print that, you know, you can read, it's legible? And, I mean, and I... Uh, it's it's another one where this is probably being done as part of your um, your sign off with the, with the printer because somebody will be responsible for um, uh, the, the the first sign off of any new labels so uh, and making sure that that's 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 there and that's that's happened um, so that's almost so long as that's there that's proving that you, you you're you're valid um, yeah. you've got a you've got a valid label um, and then on a on an ongoing basis you are uh, well, you'll be doing ongoing checks to make sure that that label uh, is, is uh, okay. It's legible. It's uh, um, yeah. yeah. It depends whether it depends whether it's pre-printed or whether you're printing it yourself. Yeah, true. Yeah, uh, Steve, our CCP is our is our labelling due to our product tree. Oh, it's disappeared. Uh, tree notes. We validate through five independent signatures to review and verify. Uh, can you see any there in the sidebar? Uh, Let's have a look. Loads and loads. <laughs> they go, they're scrolling so fast, that's right. Uh, yeah. Patrick said, in the pharmaceutical field, the production environment of validated processes stroke equipment is controlled and so revalidation is conducted whenever there are frequent failures or major failures. Uh, yeah, which would make sense if, if things are failing, something's right. Generally, if you yeah. start to get failures, um, your process isn't capable or, or something isn't, isn't, isn't right. I mean, it, it could just be that you've got an equipment breakdown, but uh, if you're getting repeated failures, that would bring you back to it's probably something within your system and uh, um, that that could mean that uh, something within your system isn't valid. Yeah, and sh you should find that through your verification procedures. You you should do yes, and and hopefully you will find it through your verification procedures rather than your customer finding it for you. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, that's a great note to finish on there, Ruth. It's uh, bang on the hour. So uh, thanks very much for today. Uh, we'll pick up. We'll pick up on any questions. I'll I'll email those. So if there's anything. Okay. Answer after if you'll do that. Um, 
thanks from myself, uh, not just for today, for all four presentations that you've delivered this year. Uh, they've all been uh, great, fantastic, different, and we, you're coming back next year, which is really pleasing as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thanks from me, thanks from the IFSQN, and thanks for all the attendees today and from the previous webinars. Great, thank you. And can I just take this opportunity to say to everybody, well, happy Christmas and happy new year, and uh, I'll talk to some of you next year. Fantastic. All right, Ruth, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to load the certificate in the sidebar now so you can get that. Um, we send a, an email. Today's been recorded. We'll send an email within 24 hours with the webinar recording and the slides and a copy of the certificate as well uh, and a link to the follow-up discussion so if you do want to uh, chat on the discussion forum a little bit more um, amongst each other that'll be fine uh, if anybody's watching this on youtube by the way the recording do subscribe to be updated uh, give us a thumbs up click the like button and also uh, put comment on the youtube as well um, let's interact all of us so thanks very much for today uh, it's Friday. Happy Friday to you. Have a great weekend. Have a food safe day. Uh, I'll let you know about next week by email. If, if, if the webinar is on next week, you'll hear about it by email. If not, there is one more uh, webinar after that before we break for the Christmas uh, period. So have a nice day. Take care, everybody.